this lecture, I'm going to talk about how we handle errors in Erlang. Um, the model that Erlang uses for handling errors is very different to the models of error handling that you will see in sequential programming languages. Uh, Erlang was designed for writing fault-tolerant systems, so error handling is possibly the thing in Erlang that is strongest. Um, uh, once you've understood error handling in Erlang, you've understand a lot about why uh, the things in Erlang are as they are. Um, if you have a sequential programming language, a sequential language has only one process. So if that one process crashes, you're going to be in deep trouble. So you will take extraordinary pains to make sure that that process doesn't crash. And that's called defensive programming. Defensive programming leads to lots of unnecessary code that handles cases which in practice don't occur often. But in Erlang, we don't do it that way. Um, we build things using large numbers of small processes. And we, we're not really so concerned if the individual processes crash. If the process crashes, then somebody else will fix up that error. That's the basic assumption we make. Before I look at what's going on inside Erlang, I just want to talk about the principle of remote error handling, because you, you don't find this in any other programming language. OK, so imagine you're going to build a fault-tolerant computing system. Well, the first thing you to notice is you can't build a fault-tolerant system with only one computer. Suppose I've got one computer, like this, and the entire computer crashes. Not, not a process inside the computer. It's not, a, it's not due to a programming error. It's due to a hardware error. The entire computer crashes. So if this entire computer crashes, you're lost. You can't do fault-tolerant computations, at least not the, talk, the sort we want to build Erlang system for with one computer. You need at least two computers. So if we have two computers and some kind of observation principle, then we can arrange to do simple fault-tolerance. We make sure that uh, a second computer observes the first computer, and if the first computer crashes, it's detected by the second computer. And we must arrange that the second computer can take over whatever the first computer was going to do. Of course, we can, we can do it in a more symmetric sort of way that we can have pairs of computers that observe each other. Um, so if the first computer crashes, the second computer will observe that error and take corrective action. And if the second computer crashes, then the first computer will, will take over. We don't really want the mechanisms for takeover and things to differ depending on the number of computers we build in our system. We want it to work if it's um, a system with one process or thousands of processes. We want the same mechanism uh, to be pervasive. OK, so I'm going to look at what happens when errors occur in processes. So let's start by imagining a system that's got a large number of processes. So these, these circles, they represent Erlang processes. OK, so here's a system that's got, how many have I got? Eight Erlang processes. And I'm supposing that any one of those processes might crash. So, so this process might crash, or, or that process might crash. As I've built that system, nothing will happen. No other process in the system will know anything about the fact that a process has died. So if that process dies, it will just die. Nobody will know. OK, so what we've added to Erlang is the notion of a link. The link, I'll show a link in uh, red. So this dotted red line, that represents a link between these two processes. Da, 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 da. That represents a link between those two processes and so on. So if I name the processes, uh, let's call that process A and that process B. There's a primitive in Erlang, I can say link A, B, and having executed link AB, it will create a link between the two processes. Now, what's the purpose of a link? The purpose of a link is to define an error propagation path. Um, and what it means is that if, if that process dies, if process A dies, the error will propagate along the links to any process at the other side of the link. So the process that will be informed if A dies is B. If B dies, and A will be informed, and, and this process here. Let, let's name these processes, call these C and D. Okay. So if C dies through any type of error whatsoever, um, then the processes A and B will be informed. And if B dies, A and C will be informed. If A dies, B will be informed. Um, in Erlang, this propagation of errors 
works across processor boundaries. So if I draw a big boundary like this around everything, and I assume that's one machine, if I take a second machine like this in a network and I put a few processes on it, wait a moment, I was using black, if I put a few processes on it here, X, process Y, process Z, and I link them together like this, uh, OK, so now we've got a, a system of processes on two physically separated nodes. This, this might be in Sweden, uh, that might be in Australia. It doesn't matter where they are. The link mechanism works exactly the same. Uh, once I've linked B and Y together and Y and Z together, if an error occurs in A, it will be propagated to B. If an error occurs in B, processes A and Y will be notified. If, if, a process, if this process has an error, these two processes will be notified. Now, the normal behavior of a process, if it gets one of these error signals, is to die itself. Okay. So, what happens in, in a system that's been linked together like this? If any of these processes, A, B, Y, or Z, dies, then all of them will die. They will all be removed. So, if that process dies, an error signal is sent to this message, this process will die. An error signal is sent to this process, this process dies. An error signal is sent to that process, and they all die. But we want to stop that from happening. So we can turn things into system processes. A system process essentially sets up a firewall whereby we can monitor the process of errors. So if I draw a red circle around there, that means that process B uh, becomes a firewall process. And it doesn't die if it receives an error signal. Now to turn it into a system process, we say process flag trap exit trap exit is true. And that means that it's trapping exits. Having said that, then B will not die um, if the process A or Y dies. What will happen is it will be sent a special form of message which it can receive in receive statement. And that receive statement is of the form receive exit PID Y. And this tells you why the process died. So this gives us a hint as to how we're going to build fault-tolerant systems. We build large collections of processes, we link them together, and we make certain ones of them into system processes which can handle the errors. And that is actually enough to build fault-tolerant systems. We need essentially two primitives, link A and B, which links two processes together, and process flag trap exits, true, which turns error signals, error signals into error messages, which can be received as if they were normal messages. That's pretty much all you need. There are some details. Link A, B links is symmetric. Uh, either A can say link B, or B can say link A, or you can link A and B together. The effect is the same. So if A dies, B gets sent a, a message. And if uh, B dies, A is sent a message. Um, that symmetry is sometimes not very convenient to deal with. And so there's something called a monitor. A monitor is a halfway link. If A says monitor B, and if B dies, A gets a message, but not the other way around. And these can be used to, in layers to build uh, fault tolerant systems. This is a large part of the OTP system. Uh, Francesco is going to tell you much more about this. This is a graph. There's, there's no structural relationship between the different processes. It just defines the error propagation paths um, what happens in the OTP system is we build them into trees rather than graphs. And let's just rub out a little bit here so we can see a tree. Um, what we'll do there is build a tree of processes, some, something like this, where these layers here, these are called supervisor nodes, their job is to look after their children, uh, and, and only that. And, and if these die, then the people above them um, are going to take care of those errors. This kind of architecture has been used to build highly fault-tolerant systems, which have been running for many years um, without intervention. I mean, I, nobody knows the longest system. We, we think there are some systems that have been running for six, seven years, um, which have never crashed. And they are built from collections of nodes 
who are programmed to, to observe each other's faults and then take corrective action. We, we don't actually take much care to, to make sure that the individual processes uh, are always alive. We let them crash and we let other processes detect those errors and we try and correct those errors. Um, it seems to be better to... If you were to make the assumption that, that we could write programs in such a way that they will never crash, I don't think we're ever going to be able to do that. We have to live with the fact that processes are going to crash and then we have to detect that remotely uh, and then we have to try and correct that. And the reason for this remoteness is based on this argument that if an entire computer crashes, the only way to correct it is in a different computer. And so that is fundamental to everything. And it's something that is very strange. It is something that you don't find in any other programming languages. Uh, other programming languages say you, you should take Trojan efforts to make sure that your program doesn't crash. In Erlang, the philosophy is, well, OK, so if something unexpected happens, just crash, because we will assume that things are always going to crash. The default assumption is we can never protect against crashing, so let's just assume that things are going to crash. Let's observe the fact that they have crashed and, and let some other process have the responsibility of fixing up those crashes. OK, so that was this section. It was very short. In the next sections, I'm going to fill in some details about how we build these fault-tolerant mechanisms. We can build these together with the kind of abstractions that I talked about earlier. And uh, in the final lectures, or in the lectures that uh, Francesco is going to give, we'll show you how this is done with the supervision trees that are part of the OTP framework. <laughs>